What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, today's episode is going to be extremely interesting and insightful. I'm going to be talking to Matthias Desmet, who is a clinical psychologist, and he is also the man who popularized the term mass formation. So we're going to go deep into this. He's got a brand new book out which is called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. So we're going to get deep into all of this. So Matthias, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Zubi. Awesome. So I've done a brief intro there, but for people who are not familiar with you, please tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so I, I am a, a professor in clinical psychology at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, I also uh, have a master degree in statistics, and that was actually how I started to be interested in the corona crisis. I started to study the statistics a little bit. And from the beginning, from the first days of the crisis, I had the impression that uh, the statistics dramatically overrated the dangerousness of the coronavirus. I started to be interested in how it was possible that an entire population worldwide um, bought into a narrative that in many respects was utterly absurd, blatantly wrong. Uh, and I... Um, after a few months, I started to, to study the crisis from the perspective of mass formation, the term you used already. I, I started to believe that what was happening in, in our society was a large scale process of mass formation, which is typically a process that makes people radically blind um, for uh, everything that goes against the narratives, the group they belong to believes in. Uh, and this to an extreme extent. So I went from somewhere in August 2020, I published my first opinion paper about mass formation. And from there, this little theory spread uh, around the world. I hear that. So for people who aren't familiar with the term mass formation, I'm aware for some of my listeners, this may be their very first time hearing that term. Can you define what mass formation means? Uh, yes, I can. I can. You know, you refer to, my, to the book I wrote, uh, and the title of the book is uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And totalitarianism, when we are talking about totalitarianism, we all think about the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, and that's right. That were the first examples of totalitarian states. Um, and back in 2017, I started to, to think about this phenomenon of totalitarianism because I had the impression that um, there was a new kind of totalitarianism emerging in Western culture and Western society, um, not a fascist totalitarianism, such as, for instance, Nazi Germany, but a technocratic totalitarianism, which, which is based on or which is a kind of highly technologically controlled society led by uh, uh, bureaucrats and technocrats. And I, I, I started to be interested in the question, what a totalitarian state exactly is and what distinguishes a totalitarian state from classical dictatorships. And the, the difference between the two, classical dictatorship and a totalitarian state is situated at the, at the psychological level. Uh, classical dictatorship relies on a very primitive psychological mechanism. It just relies on the fact that the population is scared of a small group, a dictatorial regime, um, of the aggressive potential of this of this dictatorial regime, and that's why it, it accepts that this 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 regime imposes its social contract uh, unilaterally to uh, society. But a totalitarian state is 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 based on an, on an entirely different psychological mechanism. It is based on the phenomenon of mass formation. Mass formation, which is a specific kind of group formation. Um, that is characterized by the fact that people who um, are in the grip of this kind of group formation, of this mass formation, typically, as I just mentioned already, um, believe fanatically in the narrative and in the belief system of the group to the extent that even when the narrative becomes utterly absurd, they will continue to believe in it. To give an example, in Iran, during the revolution in Iran in 1979, uh, a large-scale a large mass formation emerged in the country. And people started to believe that the 
the portrait, the, the picture of, of the Ayatollah, who was considered the leader of the, of, of the mass at that moment, was printed on the surface of the moon. And every time there was a full moon in the sky, people were standing in the streets, pointing at the moon, showing each other where the portrait of the Ayatollah exactly was printed on the surface of the moon. That's one small example, but, but mm -hmm. also... Like, it's typical, like I could give an endless list of historical examples, all showing how absurd the narratives uh, uh, might become uh, in, a, in, a, in a mass or in a crowd. And then a second characteristic of a mass formation is that when people are in the grip of this process, they become, radic they become, will they become radically willing to sacrifice everything that was important to them before the mass formation. It seems as if they are not aware anymore of their individual interests, of their egoistic interests, and as, as if they are willing to radically self-sacrifice. That's one strange uh, uh, characteristic of the phenomenon of mass formation. And then um, a third phenomenological characteristic is that when in the mass, people become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. And in the end, they always tend to stigmatize everyone who doesn't go along with the masses, who doesn't buy into the same narrative as they do. And they tend to stigmatize them with the dissonant voices. And in the end, they give typically give them a sign and start to commit cruelties towards them. Mm. Eventually try to lick with it, try to eliminate them. And they do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. Mm. That's characteristic of all the mass formations, whether we are talking about the Crusades, the witch hunts, the French Revolution, the rise of the Soviet Union or the rise of Nazi Germany, or the revolution in Iran, which I, referred, which I just referred to, we see the same time and time again. For instance, in Iran, I talked to, this, to a woman, Sharif Ishtali, a, a woman in Iran, uh, two months ago, and this, this conversation between me and her is still available on the internet, told me that she was uh, she lived in Iran during the revolution. And she witnessed, she has, she has seen with her own eyes how a mother who had reported her son to the state hung the rope around the neck of her son before he was hung and how she claimed to be a heroine for doing so. That's wow. typical for mass formation. People commit cruelties to everyone who is not loyal enough to the masses or the crowd, as if it is an ethical duty. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the, 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 the phenomenological characteristics of a mass. Mm -hmm. But then the mechanism of mass formation is more important, I think, because if you understand how a mass emerges in a society, you also start to understand what you can do to prevent that the mass formation becomes so deep, mass formation, which is a kind of group of a kind of mass hypnosis. The, the, the mechanism is identical to hypnosis. So if you understand the mechanism, you understand what you can do to prevent the masses to go so deep in the, in the mass formation that they start to become convinced that they have to eliminate everyone who doesn't go along with them. So if you want, I don't know if we have time for that, but I could try to describe the, the, the mechanism of the mass formation in a concise way. Yeah, I think that would be great. I was going to ask, is this mass formation, is this something that can happen to any society in any culture at any time? Or are there certain preliminary characteristics that make it far more likely to happen? Yes, there are. There are, there are certain... To, for a large-scale mass formation to emerge, society has, in a, has to be in a specific condition or the population has to be in a specific condition. Um, and the most central characteristic of this condition is that many people have to feel disconnected mm -hmm. from their natural and their social environment. Um, uh, people have to be in what Hannah Arendt, one of the most uh, important authors about uh, totalitarianism and mass formation, uh, called a socially atomized state. They have to feel disconnected from their environment. Um, and, and that, that typically was the case just before the corona crisis, for instance. Worldwide, over 30% of the people reported that they didn't have one meaningful relationship and that they only connected to other people through the internet. That's one example of a... Of a so the population was in, in, in an excellent state for mass formation. Worldwide, just before 
um, the corona crisis. Now, the second condition is that once people feel, social, feel disconnected from their environment, they will typically start to be confronted with experiences of lack of meaning making, a lack of purpose in life. And also that was the case. Over 60% of the people worldwide, for instance, reported that they considered their job to be a so-called bullshit job, which means a job which, in their own opinion, uh, has no, had no meaning at all. Just to and jump then, in here, Matthias, where, where are those, those statistics you're quoting, that 30% and 60%, where, where are, are those from? I, I, I describe them in my, in my book, in chapter eight, I think, and they, they are the results of a Gallup world poll, of Gallup world polls. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were, these world polls, there were several, uh, but in, in, in 2017, for instance, 30% of the people reported to, be, to feel uh, socially disconnected and 60% uh, uh, reported their job to be a bullshit job. That was in 2017, mm -hmm. and the, the numbers even increased afterwards. And this is, um, this is a, poll, a poll across the entire world? Yes, I, I, it's a worldwide poll. The Gallup, okay. the Gallup World Poll is a worldwide poll, yes. Okay. Yeah. It, sounds, it sounds surprising. For, uh, for Western numbers, it wouldn't surprise me but across the entire yes, world, yes, including indeed. Africa, yeah, that, Asia, important. and so on. That surprises me. Yeah. Indeed. That's important because um, the number of people who feel socially disconnected, who feel lonely, mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 is clearly correlated to the level of industrialization and technology use in a country. So the more industrialization, the more technology use, the more people report uh, uh, to feel lonely. For instance, in Western Europe and uh, um, in um, uh, the UK, uh, Theresa May appointed a minister of loneliness because she recognized how widespread the problem of loneliness was in her country. And in, uh, in, the, in the States, the U.S. Surgeon General um, talked about the loneliness epidemic because also there it was clear that more and more people ended up in an isolated state. Mm -hmm. uh, very important. And but, but the number of people feeling lonely or feeling disconnected increased throughout the last 200 years, yes. clearly as a consequence of the industrialization and the technology use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so let's continue on from, actually, let's, yeah. let's go to, you said you really started thinking about this a lot in 2017. So prior to the pandemic and the forced lockdowns and stay at home orders and masking and all of this stuff people have been dealing with for the past two and a half years, what was it that you were seeing in 2017 that made you take note and really start seeing these conditions rising? Yes, well, there are more conditions. There, there, is, there is one more important condition. And then I just noticed that all these conditions were rising and that we were at risk of mass formation and that we were at risk of a new totalitarianism, which was actually clear already. You could see how um, uh, the grip of government on the population became more and more firm, how... Um, the, 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 the number of the, the surveillance was, was rising in our society, how tax inspectors were allowed to, to go through all your email communication and all your, all your phones. Um, so we, 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 could, we could clearly see that uh, there was more and more, there was a tendency in our society to, uh, for a go towards a government that, that had, had a firmer and firmer grip on its population. And the population itself was actually asking that, which is also mm. typical for totalitarianism. Totalita uh, the population felt more and more anxious, asked more and more control, uh, accepted uh, that there was a, that there were these intrusions in their privacy. So, like, and 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 also, like, indeed, in particular, the psychological conditions I was referring to, the 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 loneliness, the um, the lack of meaning making, but also the third condition, which is extremely important, uh, was fulfilled, namely that people were more and more confronted with so-called free-floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression. That means a kind of anxiety, frustration, and aggression that is not connected to a mental representation. People feel anxious, frustrated, and aggressive without knowing what they feel anxious, frustrated, and aggressive for. Mm. And it, th that is an extremely aversive mental state because if you feel anxious and you don't know what you feel anxious for, you feel completely out of control. And in this condition, when a population is in this condition, lack of meaning making, uh, lack of connection, a lot of free floating anxiety, frustra frustration and aggression, something very specific might happen. If under these conditions, a narrative is distributed through the mass media, 
indicating an object of anxiety and at the same time providing a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, then all this free floating anxiety might connect to the object of anxiety and there might be a huge willingness to participate in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, even when the strategy is clearly absurd. And people do participate in a strategy just because it gives them a feeling of control. When they, they know now what they are anxious for or they think to know it, all the anxiety is connected to an object, for instance, a virus. And through participation in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, they feel in control again. For instance, lockdowns, vaccination strategies, um, mask wearing, and so on. That's the first step of mask, of, 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 of mask formation. And then the second step is even more important. Once, because many people at the same time participate in a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, because they all fight this heroic battle, collective heroic battle with the object of anxiety, people feel connected again. And that's the, it's, it, it, it is as if this most central of, of, of all these painful conditions, namely the lack of connection, the disconnected state is solved by the mass formation. But actually it isn't because in a mass, this has been described from the 19th century onwards, in a mass or a crowd, people do not connect to other individuals. They all connect separately to the collective. So the, the mass is a group that is formed, not because there are strong bonds between the individuals, but because there, are, there is a bond of every individual separately with the collective. It is even so that the longer the mass formation exists, the more the bonds between the individuals deteriorate and the more all the psychological energy is sucked away from the bonds between the individuals and invested in the bond with the collective. That makes that after a while, bonds between individuals are extremely weak, bonds between individuals and collective is extremely strong. And that explains why in the Corona crisis, for instance, everybody was talking about solidarity. Everybody was full of solidarity. At this, and at the same time, people accepted that if someone got an accident on the street, they were no longer allowed to help them. Mm. Or if parents were dying somewhere in a hospital or at home, the children were not allowed to visit them. Yes. And all this in the name of solidarity with the elderly. That's what we see time and time again. I, I referred to this mother a few minutes ago who reported her son to the state and who claimed to be heroin for doing so. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what happens. Even the strongest bonds between individuals deteriorate in a mass. Yes. And People are, re are re willing to sacrifice the people they used to love for the sake of the collective. Mm -hmm. And that's why every totalitarian state, in the end, ends up in a completely paranoid atmosphere just because it is based on mass formation. And mass formation sucks all the energy away from the bonds between the individuals and yeah. invests it in the collective. Yeah, I think you've, I mean, you've, you've nailed that. You've perfectly described what I think so many people all over the world in different places have experienced and seen, especially people who have been questioning everything that's been happening for the past two and a half years and the people who have been trying to understand it and work it out. I mean, the number of people who I'm aware of, let alone how many millions must be out there who lost friendships over the course of this time, who shifted away from their own families. There are families who now won't see each other. There are babies that were born in the past two years and people don't want uh, the uncles or the grandparents or the parents to, to see the children. There's all sorts of conflict that's been created. And as you said, it's so interesting because it's all done under the guise of health and safety and caring and compassion, but it's, it's extremely cruel. It's been extremely divisive. People have advocated for segregation and discrimination, wishing harm and death upon people who have not done anything that, that have wronged them. I mean, for me, that's been the, the darkest part of the past two and a half years has been 
I mean, I wasn't aware of this, this terminology of mass formation, but some of the mechanisms you describe prior to any Corona pandemic situation, I have looked at and done a lot of deep thinking about some of the events. I mean, even just looking at the 20th century and you're looking at the rise of these totalitarian regimes and the way that people went along with things and the way that people turned on each other and turned on their family, their, their neighbors, their fellow citizens. And ultimately, you know, that led to, you know, extremely catastrophic events in, in various countries around the world. And I've spent a lot of time, I mean, even from my childhood, just, just thinking of like, how, how is that possible? How does that happen? Because fundamentally human beings today are not different to how we were 80 years ago. We, we have more technology and more information. Great. But psychologically, we are, we're identically the same to our parents or grandparents. I don't know. Okay. If you are exactly the same. Okay. Okay. We are in a more disconnected and, and isolated state. Mm. Um, and that's also something that is described very well by uh, Jacques Elou, one uh, French author, who a wonderful author about uh, propaganda. And he says that the difference between the modern masses and the masses of ancient times is that the modern masses are lonely masses. Like the, ma the, mass, the, the masses in the crowds during the corona crisis didn't gather physically. They were all, they were, the people belonged to a mass because they shared the same ideas, the same logic, the same narrative, and the same, the same myth even, mm -hmm. which was distributed through the mass media. They all shared the same ideas and that made them into a mass, but they didn't never physically gather. And that's the excellent, the perfect condition for, for propaganda to be effective. Mm -hmm. If people form a so-called lonely crowd, a lonely mass, in that state, propaganda is maximally effective. And that's probably why the, 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 the corona narrative was so successful, after mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Why, well, why, why do you think that people have been so lonely? I mean, what do you think is at play? So prior to Prior to the past couple of years, you really noted this in 2017. I mean, is it is it just technology, or what do you think it is that's causing all these conditions? The the lack of purpose, the lack of meaning, the increasing loneliness, the increasing, as you describe it, free floating anxiety, which is not directed towards anything. Because that's something I, I even see and hear in people's own language, especially when talking to younger people. I've never seen so many people talking about having anxiety or, you know, no. feeling this way and feeling that way. And, you know, even young people talking about having PTSD and experiencing, you know, trauma and all of these things, it seems like, particularly in the Western world, um, all of these things have been these sort of pathologies, whether real or imagined, have certainly been growing a lot over the past 10 to 15 years. I'd like to say that it's been, been very noticeable. And I think we've reached, I don't know if it's at a peak. I don't know if it's at a peak now, but it's certainly at a, at a local one. Um, so what do you think are the underlying causes for that? So we've discussed the mechanism, but, but why, why is society even trending in that direction? The first five chapters of my book, uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, are all, are all about that. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do, indeed, with uh, the level of industrialization and technology used. That's a very important factor. Uh, I give some very detailed examples in my book uh, and that illustrate how exactly the use of technology leads to more disconnection and to a uh, to a lack of resonance between people and their environment. For instance, I describe the effect of the digitalization of conversations. Um, I've been studying real conversations, that mean conversations in which two people uh, who are talking to each other are physically present or physically there. Um, and the, 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 these, this, 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 this research program showed me how incredibly subtle and sublime a real conversation is. For instance, in a real conversation, 
one person reacts to the other in less than 0.2 seconds. That's five times faster than in traffic. If, if, for instance, if, if one person stops to speak, then the other will typically start speaking in less than 0.2 seconds. And that even happens when the first person stops speaking in the middle of a sentence, which shows that it has nothing to do with a kind of a rational prediction of, of when uh, the sentence will end and when uh, the other person can start, can start to speak. No, it's something else. In a real conversation, people are physically connected to each other. The bodies of two people resonate with each other. If, if, if someone listens to someone else who is speaking, then the, the, the tension in the muscles on the face is activated in the same way as the person he is listening to. And the, 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 the neuronal system also resonates, also vibrates together with the person he's listening to. And that, that, that resonance, that symbiosis, physical symbiosis, satisfied, satisfies one of the, one of the deepest um, uh, desires of the human being, the desire to be connected to someone, the desire to feel connected to someone. And that symbiosis, that resonance, drops away in a digital conversation. And that's exactly why it is as ever, that, that's why digital conversations, if we, if we do them for a long time, six or seven hours in a row, for instance, as I have been doing, uh, as I was doing during the first lockdown, make you feel exhausted. I heard so many colleagues saying this, that we feel exhausted because of all these digital conversations. And it is exactly because your body constantly tries to connect to the body of the other, mm -hmm. and it constantly fails to do so. And it exhausts itself by constantly trying to connect. And Petri Glieri articulated this in a very nice way on, on Twitter. He said, digital conversations are so exhausting because they put us constantly in the presence of the absence of the other. That's what happens in a digital, digital conversation. So that shows us, that's one example, only one yes. example. I could give many more. I could give many more. Yes. Showing that, showing that technology, on the one hand, connects us to the other. It, it, it's an excellent tool to disseminate information worldwide. But at the same time, it destroys something of the true human core of human connectedness. And the same holds for many, for, for almost every other mechanical uh, device, the use of almost any other mechanical device. I give examples such as the, the, the psychological impact of watches, of steam engines, of radio, television, and so on. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that industrialization and technology use are a very important factor that makes people uh, feel disconnected and that contributes to the emergence uh, of, of more and more uh, disorders. But then itself, I think... It, yeah. No, sorry, I think carry, carry on. Yeah, I think something is even more important. I think that, you know, industrialization and technology use in itself are a, con are a consequence of something else. They are a consequence of our view on man and the world. And it's this view on men in the world, this the dominant view on men in the world, that is the real problem that we have to overcome in our society. The dominant view on men in the world in our society since a few hundred years is a so-called mechan mechanist materialist view on men in the world. We all started to believe that the universe is a kind of material machine, a set of interacting elementary particles, atoms and molecules who interact with each other according to the laws of mechanics. And this entire machine, uh, we believe that we can describe it in a strictly rational way. And, this, and they're all, for instance, the human consciousness, our ideas, our thoughts, and our feelings are supposed to be a consequence of mechanistic interactions in our brain, of, our, of, the, of, the, of the biochemical machinery uh, uh, in our head. And it, it's that view on men in the world, I believe. That is the true problem. The strange thing is that we believe that this view on the man in the world is a scientific view on man in the world, while almost all famous scientists left it behind. They almost all left it behind. They, 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 they started from this mechanist view on man in the world. But after a while, they all considered it very limited in its capacity to explain uh, what happens uh, around us or what reality actually is. And it, it, it's strange, but I, I, I noticed in my own life that 
when I was about 16 years old, I, old, I truly believed that in the mechanist view on man and the world. I, 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 would, I considered it crazy to believe that the world would not be a materialist mechanist system, a, a, a set of elementary particles interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. But slowly, by just um, learning more and more about science, I started to see that it's not true. Yeah. It's, it, it, it took me until I was 35 years old <laughs> uh, and, and when, I, when, I, when I got really familiar with systems theory and, and the mathematical basis of systems theory before I really started to realize that what we call reality in the end is not rational, that we can never reduce it to rational understanding. It's, it's like systems theory, paradoxically, shows in a strictly rational way that the reality behaves strictly irrational. Literally, mm -hmm. nature is full of complex dynamical systems and these complex dynamical systems all behave in the same way as, in, as irrational numbers in, uh, in mathematics. For instance, to give only one example. And that's why Niels Bohr, the famous physicist who received the Nobel Prize, said that he, he, he had been studying uh, elementary particles for his entire life. And he said, when it comes to atoms, language can only be used as poetry. And he meant that. He was dead serious when he said that. Mm. Because reality, in the end, a part of reality can be reduced, can be understood in a rational way. But most part cannot. And that's, for instance, René Tom, one of the most famous mathematicians of the 20th century and one of the founders, founders of systems theory, articulated it like this. He said, this part of reality that can be understood in a rational way is very limited. And the rest of reality, he said, we can only know by empathically resonating with it. And that's, that's a true revolution we have to go to as a society. We have to overcome to transcend rational understanding and get in touch with a different way to know the world around us a way to know the world which is much more resonating, much more empathic in nature, in which it's, it's hard to define what this new or this different way of knowing the world is. But we have yeah. to look. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is, it, it's, it's so interesting to me, um, everything you're saying here. And I think, it, I love that in the, the opening chapters of your book, I like the fact that you go deep into discussing some of the problems and limitations of what, you know, both this mechanistic worldview, but also I think what a lot of lay people, especially in modern Western society, consider to be science, right? Which, and, and something I've found really fascinating is how in this sort of hard pursuit of making everything supposedly about science and supposedly about all of this. It's actually, we, we've somehow descended into a less rational perspective when people have sort of jettisoned many of these other ideas, philosophical, religious, spiritual, um, anything else that's not outside the realm of hard empirical data and stats and science and and people don't want to people some many people are not interested in, in in hearing that or listening to it or, or considering it and strangely i think people would have predicted that that would lead to uh you know more more you know let, let's get rid of all the potential apparitions and anything mentioning spirits or the soul and let's you know and, and what happened as well is scientists or well, certain scientists get elevated to this new position where they've almost become the, these new, the new priests. And there's this hard dogma and you're not, you're now not supposed to ask any questions. You're not supposed to question anything. You're not supposed to challenge anything. And it's almost like how, what people call the science has supplanted religion for many people. It's the difference between actual science. And I guess what I would call scientism which is, you know, just this trust the experts, trust the experts, follow the science, follow the science. Even if a scientist such as yourself or who, who says, wait, hang on, 
I have a question here or this doesn't make sense. I mean, this person is treated like a heretic or, you know, they've now spoke, they've now spoken blasphemy in the way maybe, you know, fundamentalist people in the past would have not tolerated any type of dissent or questioning. And it's, it's so interesting to me watching this happen under the banner of science. I think the word science has really been uh, uh, taken a, a heavy, a heavy hit over these past couple of years, because I've never seen so much nonsense in my life parading as science. Indeed, I agree. I, agree. <laughs> I think the problem, the problem is that originally science was a discourse of a minority through which a minority went against a dominant, a dominant discourse. Yes. And in the, in the beginning, it was very fruitful. It, uh, scientists, the first scientists threw every dogma and a prejudice overboard and looked at things mm -hmm. with an open mind. But throughout the last few centuries, science, as a consequence of all its great achievements, became the dominant view on the dominant discourse in society itself. So it changed from the discourse of a minority into a dominant discourse. And it became an ideology itself. Yes. It, became, it became a dogma. It became a set of prejudices itself. At least most scientists in academia mm -hmm. became dogmatic and, and, and actually became ideologists. They were no scientists anymore. And that's something dramatic, of course. Something which happens to every discourse that becomes dominant in a society. Mm -hmm. Usually it gets perverted. Yeah. And I explained that in my book. It took me a long time to understand what, why a discourse that becomes dominant uh, almost always um, uh, loses its qualities mm -hmm. as of true speech. And it's just be, I think it's just because once a, a discourse becomes, becomes a dominant discourse, it becomes the privileged instrument of manipulation, of uh, in, uh, a privileged instrument in the struggle for power. Everyone wants to use it. Someone who um, has a company wants to use it to sell, to sell his products just because he knows if I can claim that my product is scientifically proven effective, everybody will buy it. So that's, that's how a discourse uh, gets perverted when it, when it becomes dominant. That's what happened to science as well. And that's a problem we are facing now. Science mm -hmm. is no longer science. It's no longer a matter of being open-minded. It's an ideology. It's an ideology that is a, dog, a set of dogmas and prejudices itself. And indeed, as you said, in this way, science changes from something that is rational to a certain extent to something that becomes completely, absurdly irrational. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have seen in the corona crisis, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's been so interesting because people have been talking about science or even the science as if it's a, like it's one individual or an institution, right? Mm -hmm. So not, not a method or a body of ever-changing work or something that's supposed to be challenged or questioned, almost just like a, a doctrine. This is the science and every country and every city had its own science, <laughs> which is also uh, interesting. And whether you're a scientist or a doctor or just a lay person or whatever, if you had any question, it was just, you know, I think that's another key factor is just the power of, I guess, two things. Number one, the natural human urge for social conformity. Most people want to be in the majority and they want to get along with people and avoid conflict and avoid arguments, all of that. And then I think with that also just comes the power of fear. And in this case, I mean, if you really think about the past couple of years, fear of the virus was a small part of it, but there were much greater fears at play. The fear of social ostracization, the fear mm -hmm. of people losing their jobs. If you were a doctor who had some questions or wanted to promote some alternative therapies, you could, you could lose your job. You could lose your voice on social media. You could be censored on YouTube. You could lose money. Um, there were all sorts of fears that were at play. So even when there were people who wanted to ask questions 
or wanted to challenge things or didn't understand things, they felt so fearful that they couldn't, they felt like they couldn't say anything. They felt like they were silenced. And that was another very interesting mechanism that I think kept this formation going. I mean, it's still happening. It's still happening now, honestly. It hasn't really finished yet, depending on no. where somebody is located. And then on top of that, there's also the ego. There's also the unwillingness for people to say, hmm, I was wrong, or maybe I got that part wrong. You know, maybe I made a mistake. I mean, if you look at all the governments across the world, you look at all these so-called public health experts, all of these uh, people in different fields, even in the media, I mean, how many people have said, oh, we, we made a mistake or we got something wrong. Instead, what they say is the science changed, mm, yes. right? No, nobody, <laughs> nobody got anything wrong. The no. science changed. And that was the sort of excuse that now, oh, okay, you know, we can just keep on going and we can keep changing the narrative. And yesterday we told you this, tomorrow we're telling you this, and now we're saying this and that, and none of it adds up or makes sense. But it's like v nobody who's in one of these positions wants to just admit, okay, we, we got some things wrong. Maybe we overestimated this. Maybe we underestimated that. We counted this incorrectly. Our prediction models were wrong. This thing didn't do what we, what we told everybody it was going to do. And um, it's just this sort of web of dishonesty and ego. And it's, it's very frustrating to watch. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And I agree with you. The fear of the virus was, uh, well, one of the examples of anxiety in the, cri in the crisis, but probably... Uh, the group pressure or, 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 or was, 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 a, was a more important factor. And mm. um, yes, that's, it's, it's extremely important, I think, to, to see like this phenomenon of mass formation, the combination of all kinds of factors and all kinds of uh, psychological forces makes it extremely powerful, um, makes the mechanism of mass formation extremely powerful. It's identical to hypnosis, as I just mm. said, uh, like in a, 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 in hypnosis, there is someone, a hypnotist, who withdraws the attention of, of someone else from, from reality, from the environment, and focuses it all on one small aspect of reality. For instance, an object that is um, um, swinging on a, on, a, on a little chain or something, or, or, or the voice of the hypnotist. And after that, it, it is as if the rest of reality doesn't exist anymore. Um, and then this, 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 this mechanism of the focusing of attention is extremely strong. Right? So like, like a simple hypnotic procedure is sufficient to make someone not aware anymore of what happens with his body. Mm. A simple hypnotic procedure is sufficient to make someone completely insensitive to pain to this extent that you can perfectly perform an operation, a surgical operation on someone who is under hypnosis. It happens all the time here in, in the university ho hospital in, in a university hospital in Belgium, someone, uh, a doctor, uh, hypnotizes a patient, a patient with a simple procedure, and then a surgeon can cut through the skin, the flesh, even straight through the breastbone without the patient noticing it. And that's exactly what happens in a mass formation. First, there is this period in which, stage in which all the People's attention, people's anxiety, frustration, aggression uh, is, is starting to float freely, is withdrawn from reality. Then there is this narrative that focuses everything on a small part of reality. For, for instance, the virus and the, and the measures to, to fight the virus. And then it seems as if all the rest of reality doesn't exist anymore. The measures, we knew from the beginning that the measures would probably claim more victims uh, then the virus could claim, even in the worst case scenario. And, but people just were not sensitive to the victims of the measures anymore. The attention was focused on one point and you could try to show them and tell them as, as much as you wanted that there were other victims, that there were victims of the measures, that children would starve in developing countries because uh, of, the, uh, of the, the damage done to the economy. Mm -hmm. That there would that that many people would die from delayed um, uh, treatments doesn't didn't matter to the people. The only thing that had a psychological impact was the virus and the victims of the virus, just because all their psychological energy was focused at that point. As soon as as soon as you understand that, you you have to you, you can start to understand 
what we should do in this situation. And because the mechanism of mass formation is extremely strong, it's an extremely strong type of hypnosis. And from the 19th century onwards, people like Gustave Le Bon said that when people are in the grip of mass formation, well, well when a mass formation emerges, a certain part of the population, usually 20, 25, 30%, will be really in the grip of this process. And the other people will either remain silent because they are scared of the masses. And there is always a small percentage of people that wants to do something about it, that wants to speak out. And it's typical, yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's, it's typical that these people, that when, the, when these people speak out, they do not succeed in waking up the masses. Usually they won't succeed, mm -hmm. but, and that's something extremely important. Gustave Le Bon described already in, in the 19th century that indeed these people might not be able to wake up the masses, but that their speech, but that doesn't mean that their speech has no effect. Gustave Le Bon said, that when there are people who continue to speak out, the, they will constantly disturb the mass formation and they will make sure that the mass formation doesn't go so deep that it reaches this dramatic level where the people in the mass start to commit, helped by their leaders, start to commit cruelties towards the people who do, who do not want to go along with the mass. And there are historical examples that show this very clearly like in the Soviet Union and in Nazi Germany. It was exactly at the moment opposition, the dissonant voices stopped to speak out and went underground that the cruelty started. Mm. In 1930, this happened in the Soviet Union. In 1935 in Nazi Germany, the opposition, the resistance stopped to speak out. And within six months, the cruelty started. And so that's, that's the entire point. It's not because you do not convince the people in the crowd that you do not have an effect. You do have an effect, a huge effect. Yeah. You make that people, that the fanatic conviction of the people in the mass doesn't go so far that they are convinced that it is their ethical duty to start to stigmatize, eliminate, destroy the people who do not go along with them. So that's just crucial. It's crucial to understand that. As soon as you understand that, you know that you have to continue mm -hmm. to speak out. Even Absolutely. when we have the impression that, uh, that we do not succeed in waking them up. That's true. But we do have an, a different effect, which is crucial. Yeah, that, that part's so important. What do you think it is that, why do you think some people didn't Go, didn't go with it. What what what's different about that small percentage of people who number one notice that something is wrong, and then number two feel the necessity or have the boldness or courage to ask questions in the face of all of this adversity and rocking the boat? Because something I've seen really interesting over these past two and a half years is it doesn't seem to. Um, it, whether people kind of totally got sucked into it or partially or not at all, it doesn't seem to be linked at all to what we would typically call intelligence or, or IQ or anything like that. It's not like, Oh, you know, the smart, smart people didn't get sucked into it. And uh, you know, st stupid people did or something like that. It's not, it's not like that at all. It seems to be more based on personality traits or perhaps prior preconditions or something like that. And I think it's interesting that you use the example of individual hypnosis, because I'm aware that also not everybody can be hypnotized, correct? Some people can be hypnotized easily. And there are some people who seem to be very, very resistant to it, even with the best hip, hypno, uh, best hypnotists, they just don't, they don't fall under the, under the spell. So from a, from a psychologist perspective, what do you think is at play there? Nobody knows. Okay. Nobody knows, but well, one thing is clear and intelligent intelligence uh, doesn't play a role uh, and as concerns the level of education the higher the level of education the more vulnerable for mass formation mm -hmm. that's uh, something that also has been described since the 19th century onward why, why, why do you think that is 
That's also a good question. Yeah. It might have to do with the fact that our education system maybe uh, doesn't really learn us to think for ourselves, but rather learns us to think in the same way. It learns us all to think in the same way. It learns us to conform to um, one way of thinking. That could be an explanation. There is another possible explanation, and it is that the more people feel the urge to uh, get a degree, uh, the more they are driven by um, a willingness or a desire to conform to social ideals, to social standards. That's also a possibility. Nobody really knows. Yeah. Nobody really knows, but it's, it has been observed time and time again. Um, it seems that going along with the masses or going against them has to do with the most fundamental choice a human being can make at every moment in his life. We always can choose to take the easy way and to do as everyone else does, mm -hmm. even if we know somewhere that uh, what uh, the majority does is absurd or cruel or, 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 or stupid or uh, counterproductive, or we can make a, choose the more difficult way and just staying loyal, stay loyal to what we believe is sincere and honest mm -hmm. and try to speak out, try to articulate these thoughts and ideas and words that seem sincere and honest to us. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to believe that uh, we are the only ones who know the truth or something. Just yeah. what we have to do is just living up to the ethical duty of saying what at a certain moment to you seems right, correct, sincere and honest. That's all we have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that's also the most uh, efficacious way to speak. Not trying to convince the other, but just say, look, okay, that's your opinion. You believe that if you, would, uh, if you wouldn't have taken your three jabs, you would have been even more sick than you are now. Uh, I look at things differently. Yes. I, uh, I, I have a different opinion. Um, I think there are other ways to protect yourself from, um, from disease. Um, and I will just tell you what I think. And then you can do with it what you want. That's my opinion. That's yours. You mm -hmm. can do with it what you want. At that moment, you have the maximal effect. At that moment, if you are too pushy, you will make the other a little bit angry. He will lock himself up in, 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 in his own opinion even more. Uh, but if you just speak out, say what you think, the resonating qualities of your voice will disturb uh, the fanatic conviction in the other that he or she uh, is the only one who is uh, thinking uh, in a rational or a sound way or something. So that's, uh, that's one thing we, we should do, we should try to do. Uh, the other thing, of course, the more fundamental thing is that as a society, we have to switch, we have to move on to a different view of man in the world. As I just said, it's this, throughout the last centuries, we have been so convinced, or we have been thinking that rational understanding should be the basis of society, uh, is the most important and the most crucial thing um, in human existence. Um, rational understanding, I think, is important, mm -hmm. but it's only the first stage of the process of developing true knowledge. If you follow logic and rational understanding in a truly honest way, you will soon arrive at a point, at the limit of it, and you will feel, as all major scientists concluded, that beyond a certain point, you cannot grasp things in a logical way anymore and that you have to move on to a different way of knowing yes. the world. That's something that is crucial in, in when we learn an art or a, or a craft or something. In, in, the, in the learning process, there is always first this rational stage in which we learn in a rational way uh, the rules of the art. We learn how what we need to do in order to make a certain object or in order to make music or something else. So the first stage of the process of learning an art or a craft is a rational stage. But then, if we practice 
these rational rules a lot, we will slowly start to develop a certain feeling, a certain, a certain skill that transcends, that is more than rational, than a rational skill, than rational understanding. In Japan, they have this great proverb saying, um, if you want to become a master in, a, in an art, you first have to protect the rules of the art and then break them and throw them away. And that's, that's the moment yeah. when you start to develop this feeling, this more intuitive knowledge, this more resonating knowledge with the object or with the, with the art of or with the craft. That's the moment where you, where you become a master in the art of in the, or in the craft. And uh, that's also the moment where you become in touch, where you start to, to get in touch with the eternal principles of the art and also the internal principle of humanity, of life. And that's, that's, that's the essence of the revolution you have to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of a culture centered on rationality and or, or pseudo-rationality, yes. you have to become a culture that is centered on a more resonating knowledge, um, which is the true knowledge in life, which um, makes us resonate with the eternal music of life. And I experienced that very much in my own life. When I was about 35 years old, I started to really become aware of the fact that what we call the facts or reality around us does not behave in a rational way or in a logical way. And it was at that moment, almost literally, I think, when I think as when you think in a logical way, you, co you connect the one logical idea to the other logical idea. And it is as if you build a closed wall of rational ideas, of logical ideas around you. And as soon as you start to understand that in the end, ultimately, um, rational understanding is very limited, it is as if all these logical ideas, it is as if they can open up again, as mm -hmm. if there, there is a space between the logical ideas. And at that moment, that the vibration, the music, the eternal music of life around you, can go through the logical wall and that your the strings of your own being can start to resonate with the eternal music outside of you. And that's the moment also, I think. Almost literally, I describe mm -hmm. this in my book, it's almost literally. The human being is a string instrument, also at the physical level. The muscles are a kind of strings that are on the skeleton. And at the moment, you can start to resonate with the vibration and the, the music around you it is at that moment that you also can start to tolerate the ideas of death and dying and suffering just mm -hmm. because you feel that the end of your physical existence is not the end of everything. You yes. feel that you participate in something eternal and something eternal. And that's, that's, also, that's the, the fundamental disease, I think, of our culture. It's, it's man, it, dude, uh, sorry, to, sorry, to, I, I love what I love what you're saying. It, it's so interesting to me because what what's happening is like that that actually is circling back to very, very basic and fundamental religious ideas. Right. Of and I think that for I, I found in my in my own life, even with with people I know and even looking at society at large, I think that. And this was really, really highlighted over the past two and a half years. And this is simply the concept and view of our own human mortality, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether or not someone believes in God or follows or religion, this is, you know, that's, that's, that's what people want to want to believe or not. But certainly for people who, who have faith, whether someone is a, a Christian or Jewish or Islamic or so on, is there is a concept of mortality. It's a different, it's a whole different concept of mortality because you, you're not simply believing that this life here and now on this materialistic earth is the be all and end all. Yes, it's important, but there's, there's more beyond that. And I think that totally changes the way people view death in general, both, both their own potential death but also other people's. I think that what was really highlighted over the past two and a half years is actually how uncomfortable people have become with this relationship and concept of mortality. People were acting as if prior to 2020, nobody used to die. I mean, there are many countries where the average age of death, whether from or with COVID was, I think in the UK, it was 82. 
which is mm. the same actually as the average life expectancy. I think in mm. the USA, it was something like 78 or 79. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yes, every, everyone's life matters and nobody wants their, their parent or their grandparent or whatever to, to, to ever die. Really. You know, we'd mm. sort of like to have this life where, Oh, you know, no, no one ever dies, but it, I'm kind of like an 85 year old dying of a disease is not, it's not the same as a, as a 15 year old or a 25 year old dying of a disease Pri prior to this year when the media wasn't putting so much focus and attention on this one very central particular thing, there have been about six, I mean, I think, I believe around 60 million people every year in the world die every single day, thousands and thousands of people are dying, but the attention wasn't focused on it. And it was suddenly mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, we are, we are, we are mortal beings. We can get sick. We can transfer diseases to each other. We can die. People were acting like this was some brand new revelation, which was something that was very confusing to me because I was like, well, we've we've had diseases and we've been spreading them and we've had every, every flu season, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people do do pass away, unfortunately. But we were always comfortable with that. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't try to do anything to minimize it, but you understood that as people get older and older and older, at some point, they're going to they're going to pass away from something. And this actually leads me to one of the there's a paragraph in your book, I think it's in chapter two, which I actually, I liked it so much. I took, I took a photo of this paragraph and I want to actually read it on the podcast because I thought it was very, I thought it was very profound. This was after you were talking about um, meaningless jobs and the rise of meaningless jobs. So you wrote, the rise of meaningless professions shows us that the real problem of humanity lies in human relationships more so than in the struggle with natural forces or in the physical demands of work. Simply put, in a society in which human relationships are satisfying, life will be bearable even if it has only primitive means of production. Whereas in a society where human relationships are impoverished and toxic, life will be difficult and unbearable, however advanced such society may be in terms of me mechanical, technological evolutions. And I, I thought that was just, I thought that was a, an in incredible paragraph and, and very much in line with some of the observations that I see when I look at the so-called economically developed countries and less economically developed countries. And you're looking at things like mental health and people's relationships and general health, happiness, well-being, all of that. And I think it's so deep because with this hyper-materialistic worldview, um, it's got this sort of arrogant element to it where people think, okay, we just need more tech and more stuff and faster and bigger and more expensive and people get detached and fragmented from each other and they lose that meaning and suddenly they have anxiety and depression and all this and that whereas you can go to places where people are far more impoverished things are not as advanced there isn't as much technology but actually people have strong bonds with their families with their communities they have purpose they have meaning they're living their life and they they have different struggles they have a more uh, obvious and sort of external struggle, but this internal struggle that I think so many modern people are having and these battles they're having within themselves, it's far less, uh, it's far less predominant over there. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. No, indeed. I think um, we situate the problem uh, at the wrong point at this moment. Mm. Um, and also we, we rely on... We, the, the entire striving to uh, build a society based on rational information, for instance, is doomed to fail. It's doomed to fail. The only thing that can organize a society in a truly, truly humane way um, is ethical principles. Yes. Ethical principles that um, structure the interpersonal relationships um, and that, that, that's, that's, again, like, that's also, uh, you know, I, I, there was this, I, I believe that we were talking about this, this different kind of knowledge, which is more uh, resonating knowledge. Uh, uh, um, and I think that this, this different, this resonating knowledge gets us really in touch with the, with the things around us. And in this way, we learn about, or we start to feel according to what principles 
nature, reality, um, functions. And it are these principles that if we follow them, if we stay loyal to them, these eternal principles that can make us behave in such a way and that can make us live, live together in such a way uh, and live a life worthy of a human being. You know, there is this wonderful uh, chapter in uh, the book of uh, Solzhenitsyn. I don't know if you, if you know him, the Russian writer who Gulag wrote the whole book, the Gulag, the Gulag Archipelago. Mm -hmm. um, in which he describes his, his life in the concentration camps of Stalin. He lived for 15 years, I think, in the, in the gulags, the Russian concentration camps. And he describes that how most prisoners uh, started to behave in a beastly manner, in a beast-like manner. And they crushed each, other, each other's skulls during the night just to steal each other's food and clothes. They became even worse for each other than the guards were already for them. Mm -hmm. And he also describes how a small part of the prisoners evolved in the opposite direction. They, in this pool of darkness, they wanted to make sure that they remained human, human and that they, 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 they stayed loyal more and more, even in a more convinced way, in a more determined way to their ethical principles. And he refers, he refers to one of these guys, uh, Ivanovich Grigoriev, I think was his name. I also, I, 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 I refer to him as well in the, in the last chapter of my book. And this guy entered the, the gulags, the concentration camps in a sickly way. He suffered from rheuma and, and, and several other medical conditions. And, but from the first moment on, he stayed loyal to his ethical principles. If they stole his food and his clothes, he refused to, to steal the food and the clothes of other prisoners himself. If the guards commanded him to do something that he considered unethical, he refused to do so, to do so no matter what the punishment was. And Solzhenitsyn describes how this guy became stronger and stronger. While, while most prisoners died in, died in a few weeks to a few months, he became stronger and stronger. And he survived the concentration camps also for 10 or 15 years. As I don't know it exactly anymore. But and Solzhenitsyn says that that showed him something that you cannot understand if you start from a, a, a materialist view of man in the world. He said that it showed him how crucially important principles are for a human being. And I think that also for us here in this situation, we constantly try to know and to predict uh, what will happen in the next years, in the years to come. But actually, we cannot predict that. It will be very chaotic, and nobody knows exactly what will happen. We shouldn't spend too much energy trying to know what will happen. We should spend more energy, I think. And this one thing we can be sure of, and it is that we, ourselves, will stick to the principles of humanity in a world that is increasingly dehumanizing. I think if we do that, maybe all the rest will be done for us. And we can expect a lot. I think in this period, this, 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 in this, um, in these, in the years to come, the years to come will be extremely important. A lot will happen, um, and um, a small group will rediscover something that was considered unimportant in the last few centuries, namely the principles of humanity ethical principles. Nobody can articulate these principles in a definitive way. We have to, you can feel them and we have to re-articulate them, reinvent them time and time again. And one of these principles for me is as a human being that you have the ethical duty to speak out. That's one of the principles. Um, and in the years to come, we might reinvent them, rediscover them. And rediscover that it are these principles, yeah, staying loyal to these principles. Mm -hmm. That is the most crucial thing a human, a human being can do. Um, and the rest, well, the rest we cannot control and we shouldn't control, I think. We should just accept that what happens now is something that had to happen. It's a natural process. 
in which a, a large organism, a mass or a dominant society, exerts a lot of pressure on a small group and pushes this group on a path where it would never go without this pressure and makes it discover something new. It's a natural, it's, it's a natural process of birth. Something, something large gives birth to something new, something small. Mm -hmm. And we have to accept that. We have to just, just accept that and um, accept everything that happens and just keep the focus on the principles that are necessary for a human living together. I love that. And I think that's, man, that's profound and that's powerful because of course we can't, we can't predict the future and we, there are so many things in this world that we cannot control individually, nor even collectively, but we can certainly have more control over how we, how we view things and how we react to them. And we don't know where we're going to be one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, but I a hundred percent, I'm on board with you that if we have the right ethics, morals, and principles, then whatever comes our way as individuals and as humanity and societies as a whole, then that's when I'm confident that, okay, we can deal with this. We can get through this. We've been through, the human race has been through some really, really, really dark and terrible stuff. Some of which we have, have talked about and have come out on the other end of it. So that's something that absolutely gives me some optimism. And on that note, Matthias, man, I could, I could talk to you for so long, but I want to be respectful of your time. It's been an amazing conversation. I really love and value your insights. Your book is fantastic. I haven't gotten to the very end of it just yet as of recording, but making some good headway with it. And it's got some amazing takeaways. So where can people check out the book and where can people find more of your work and follow you perhaps online if they'd like to? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook um, and the book well the title of the book is The Psychology of Totalitarianism most people buy it on Amazon yes they do <laughs> um, I think there are other ways to, to, uh, to buy it I'm not sure my, the, the, my publisher is uh, Chelsea Green on their website on the website you will definitely find the book and from uh, next week on I think it will be available uh, uh, this week. From this week, it will be available in the uh, in the UK. In, yeah, in the I think by, by the by the by the time this podcast comes out, it will be it will be available okay. everywhere. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. So, um, I guess if you just take a look on the internet, you will find where you can buy it. I, I'm not an expert in it, to be honest. I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't buy my book myself, <laughs> but. Uh, um, um, I got it for free. <laughs> hey. uh, yes. Well, you, you can definitely buy it through Amazon. I know that. No. Awesome. But of course, no. 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 Welcome. Matthias Desmond, thank you so much for coming on the Real Talk with Zuby show. And if you are listening, highly recommend the book. It's called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. So go on Amazon and check that out. Thank you, Matthias. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me, Zuby. And I like the talk as well. I liked it very much to, to talk with you. <laughs>